The central puzzle for today is why, if poverty is ubiquitous, why certain countries have links between poverty or lack of development and conflict, but not in others. And I think the Bur uh, Burundian case study, as well as countries in the region, highlight a lot of the relationships that the authors we've read today, as well as the general field of civil conflict, have linked economic factors to conflict. It's not possible to cover them all today, but I just wanted to highlight a couple of elements about the Burundian case study, and I'll end with encouraging you to, to see a couple of quick, brief videos uh, that will provide a more visceral description of where Burundi has come from and where it is right now. But I think the Burundian case study is, is uh, unfortunately uh, an example of a lot of things, a lot of challenges that other similar countries have faced and uh, a lot of uh, difficulties for the for the people within the country. First, there was a, similar to a lot of countries around the world, there was a push to democratize after the end of the Cold War. There was an internationalized civil conflict that led to a negotiated settlement. I wasn't able to go to Burundi when I was in the region. I was able to go to Rwanda. Not sure how much uh, um, this is worth now um, because of the ongoing instability in Burundi, but there, there was a negotiated settlement. There was a problematic uh, election with a leader who didn't want to leave, changed the term limits to um, allow him to stay on, ended up um, dying uh, a few years ago, and there was the, a, a potential for opening over the last couple of years, as we're going to see in the videos. Uh, ethnic divisions that led to uh, violence. Um, going back to the, to the 1960s and, and early 70s, and a fundamental rejection of a number of international norms. Um, so these are factors we're going to see in a bunch of other countries. I think Burundi is uh, an unfortunate example of them happening in one particular country. And oh, going backwards. So a couple of basic facts about Burundi that might be helpful before you watch the videos, as well as um, that I wanted to highlight now. It is a country of almost 12 million people, over uh, a slightly over a million in the capital of Bujumbura. Um, the size is roughly 12 times the size of the ACT here. So uh, bigger than the ACT, but not that much bigger. And it has 11, almost 12 million people. The main ethnic groups are Hutu, 85%, Tutsi, 15%, and Twa at 1%. So um, a bit similar to neighboring Ru Rwanda and Relit and one of those cases that are higher risk of ethnic driven conflict or political um, uh, conflict, uh, according to Collier and Hoffler and a bunch of others works as well. Life expectancy is around 65 years for men and 69 years uh, for women, uh, which is better than some other countries in the region. Agriculture is responsible for over 40% of GDP and 90% of unemployment, 90% uh, of employment, with a GDP per capita of around, uh, with purchase power parity of around 700 US dollars. Um, so agriculture employs almost all the people Irrigation is still a rarity, which we're going to be talking about more in the water and food works uh, weeks. And as a landlocked country surrounded by uh, other countries that have had a history of political instability, um, but also bordering uh, with the lake, Lake Tanganyika, um, providing a way to, to export countries to other countries in the region and import as well as we'll see in one of the videos at the end of, uh, end of this. Um, it is dependent on rain-fed agriculture, which can make it harder to plan, uh, depending on good or bad uh, weather years. And the population distribution, which is something we're going to be talking about in the population week in a few weeks, is also one that's similar to other countries in the region, in which you have a pretty good-looking uh, pyramid, uh, or stupa no it's more more just direct pyramid in which you have the vast majority of people under uh under the age of 25 um and 
that population as it gets older is going to be at increased need of, of services with a population growth that is also um, um, pretty high, which is a challenge we're going to see in the population week uh, as well. A couple of brief uh, facts for the background, which will, I think, um, there's a number of ways of there's no good 10 minute description video for this. So I just wanted to try to highlight a couple things. And then some of the videos that I'm going to have after this will touch on each one of these issues. The country received uh, independence from Belgium in 62. Belgium is still a large trade, uh, trade partner, also a diplomatic partner. They got rid of the monarchy and established a republic in 66. And 72, 120,000 Hutus were massacred by government f uh, forces and supporters in the wake of a Hutu-led uprising. So a huge repressive effort by the government to maintain control after a Hutu uprising. The Tutsi-led uh, government um, cracked down quite hard against the Hutus, and we're going to see in one of the videos the information about what happened during that time period in this truth and reconciliation report is still something that's incredibly raw uh, decades later. There was a successful military coup in 76, a one-party state in 81, similar to a lot of other countries in, in the region, another coup in 1987. I mean, coups and military di dictatorships are not unique to the area. During the Cold War, there were also a number of examples in Latin America as well as Asia. After the end of the Cold War, there was a huge push, and we're going to talk about in the Political Institutions Week, towards democratizing and opening up the international system and the domestic system. So there was a new constitution in 92 calling for a multi-party political system. The first... Uh, elected president came in and then was assassinated in 93. Um, uh, Melchior Nadade, uh, who was a Hutu, after less than five uh, months in office. Then there was a civil war, kind of similar to uh, Rwanda in, uh, in 94, after their president was uh, shot down. However, uh, the Rwandan genocide uh, in 94 um, ended with a, with a victory by the um, Rwandan Patriotic Front, uh, whose leader is now still in power, while in Burundi it, it lasted until 2005. Um, that, that civil war ended up leading to double the deaths of that government repression back in the 70s with 300,000 deaths. Um, um, the new president actually in 94 died on the same plane, coming back from the uh, Arusha uh, peace meetings in, in 94. Um, the... Uh, Democratic elections um, succeeded the end of the war in 2005. Pierre and Kurinziza was elected in 2005. Um, the peacekeeping mission that the UN brought in the country to help that transition after 2005 was shut down two years later in 2007. Um, Kurinziza was re-elected in 2010, th stood for a third term in 2015 after um, a domestic court ruled in his favor. Um, increasing protests, there was uh, a failed coup, uh, which was similar to a lot of other um, leaders who extended their terms past the constitutional, I mean, uh, limits, including um, uh, uh, Kagame in Rwanda, Yari Museveni in Uganda, um, the Kabila father and son in the DRC. Um, there was efforts at trying to challenge the leadership and um, protest the crackdown of a leader staying in power after the uh, after um, his term, the constitutionally amended term, which should have ended in 2015. His uh, resistance to all that was strong, and as there was increasing... Um, efforts by people to bring the International Criminal Court in to try to monitor what was going on and this increasing repressive efforts. Um, Burundi was the first state to actually leave the International Criminal Court in, uh, in 2017. Um, and then his death in 2019 led to uh, a new president coming in and it calls for more opening and the, the videos uh, will talk a bit more about the reopening uh, economically with the redesign of the new port as well as politically although there have been reports of repression still um, still occurring within the country but I think in a lot of ways it's, it's an example of a country that struggled with 
economic stability and economic development, with political security and violence, with um, weak institutions and pressures to be able to provide human security for the um, for the citizens, in an ethnically salient division between groups within the country, um, that I think it it highlights a number of the issues both for economics that we've covered this week as well as for other issues which we're going to be covering later on in the semester. So I think with that, I would encourage you to take a look at the Burundian videos. I think I'll sum up now and then let you end with looking at um, a few things that have been going on within the country in, in recent years. Um, I think to bring it back to the motivating puzzles, right, and the motivating question, how does how does money cause problems as well as help provide for solutions? Um, but I think the the fundamental uh, argument is related to greed, grievances, and the role of money in incentivizing um, conflict as well as helping to prevent it. Um, the puzzles where grievances are everywhere, but conflict is rare. And I think the evidence so far suggests that grievances lead to action due to opportunistic actors who have their resources or realistic chance of success, tying back to Collier and Hoffler's um, cost-benefit model. Um, greed, of course, is ubiquitous as well. Everyone might not want to rule the world, but they'll want their own slice of the pie and their own human security. But the greed can be triggered through opportunistic actors, right? People who are willing to take the lead, to organize, to motivate, to bring people together, or those in power in the government to be able to try to seek for private goods or public goods. Um, countries like Burundi that have weak political institutions, either through a colonial history, um, a history of political instability or inflation, like we talked about earlier, um, there's some countries in my African politics class that I taught last semester. We talked a lot about how parallel sources of power that you have the the de facto political institutions, uh, the the de jure political institutions, and the de facto parallel sources of power and influence, similar to um, other areas with uh, weak political institutions like. Um, uh, the mafia in, in Sicily, um, and just areas in which there's high stakes. Uh, governments that control a large amount of the economic output, often driven by natural resource extraction, which we're going to see in a few weeks, that creates high stakes for control of a particular region or for the particular country. Uh, also, if a large part of the wealth is concentrated by the government's control, that also provides higher stakes for control as opposed to a more complex economy in which the government plays a smaller role compared to private actors. So there's a lot of there's a lot in that, right? And we're going to be going through the implications for the greed and grievance explanations, opportunity arguments, and economic explanations for conflict over the rest of the semester. But this is a simplified way of taking a step back and looking at how this one simple relationship between um, economics and conflict and economics and human development uh, and conflict will uh, be important for our understanding of the drivers of conflict. With that, I hope you enjoy the Burundi videos and I hope you have a great day.